Thank you very much, Diane. I'm um, happy to be here. It's my first time uh, that into the CC to PhD program, and I'm thrilled. I was happy to be invited. I hope it'll be the first of oh, thanks. of many um, times. Um, my name is uh, Jose Felipe Martinez. Um, I'm an associate professor at the School of Education here, teaching uh, research methods. Uh, a lot of uh, courses having to do with uh, survey methodology, measurement, statistics. Uh, which, as I will try to sell to you throughout the, the talk, and then at the end, it's a, it's an area of, uh, of very important growth and a lot of interest. But there's a lot of uh, talent needed um, uh, throughout the country in many areas. I am um, uh, from Mexico, a Mexican uh, from the great state of Aguascalientes, which has been shown scientifically to be the best state in Mexico. <laughs> um, and so I. Came to the U.S. in 1998 and then started at UCLA in uh, 2007, I believe it is. So I've been teaching this this course and engaging this type of research for the better part of 10 years um, here. Um, I was invited to talk to you about uh, survey methods, and it's a topic that I care greatly about that I think is very exciting, like I was telling you before. It's also a very very hard topic to give a, an hour long talk on because it has so many interesting areas and sub-areas, each of which basically deserves a course, and the course that we teach, for example, in my department. But um, I'll give it a try, and then at the end you'll tell me if it, if it works or not. I'll try to give you a very broad overview of surveys, survey research, what, it, what are they, uh, why do we use them, and then uh, a little bit, we'll spend a little bit of time thinking about methodological issues and uh, the how, how do we go about uh, um, designing and conducting surveys. Um, like David said, I'm happy to take specific short questions throughout the talk. I'm not at all, uh, 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 I don't mind at all to be interrupted, so feel free to raise your hand and ask like, a clarification question. But if you have a broader question, um, we'll also have time for that at the end. A broader question about coursework, about the field, about uh, something that may not be, sort of, uh, may, may not get a short answer. Save those for the end and we'll, we'll handle them. Uh, there's time for that and I'm happy to continue to chat with you afterwards. Is that okay? Good? All right. So, start with a bit of terminology, definition of what is a survey. Um, so, it is originally a, a term coined from the Latin super and videre, which as you can see means overview. And so essentially, you can think of a survey as an overview. It's, it's a, a process a person of gathering information about a large group. It started being a physical survey, so a large geographic area. You still think of the geological U.S. geological survey. That's also a survey. In fact, that's the original term, uh, a sense of the term uh, as, a, as a geographic uh, technique. But it's expanded to covering or, or presenting overviews of populations, organizations, social structures, social institutions, social issues. Um, a more modern and relevant definition, or a couple of them for us, would be, I'll read one of those, a variety of tools and techniques used to collect information, to describe, compare, or explain individual societal knowledge, values, preferences, behaviors, and attitudes. And there's another definition there that's just as good and I won't read for you. Right. So I want, I want to ask you to raise your hand if you've taken, ever taken a survey, because I know you all have. At, some, at one point or another, you were given a survey to fill out uh, with questions about a billion different possible topics. And so uh, I think it's pretty close to you know, impossible for someone at your age to not have taken a survey before. But I'll ask you a question that will reduce the group uh, uh, quite a bit, I think, or typically does. How many of you have? taking a course that involved in some way questions about how to conduct surveys. So how, how many of you have thought of surveys from the back end, from the perspective of how do you develop them, deploy them, use them, as opposed to having taken them before? All right, so not a, not a small group. Can I ask just a couple of you what, what course would that, would that have been? Statistics. Statistics? Statistics? Anyone with another that's not statistics? Psychology. Research methods in psychology. Research methods in psychology? Something like that? Social psychology and sociology research methods. Yeah, okay, good. So 
typically, when you find that, and I'm very pleased to see quite a large -ish group, larger than, than I often find even in my classes here, um, that a number of you have already had some exposure to the, some of the issues that, it, that are involved in developing and conducting surveys, which are often, which we can often classify in statistical issues and then other methodological research, met, uh, research design issues that are not necessarily statistical, they can have connection with statistics, but they are not, not statistical. So, as, at a first stage, it is important to realize that, like I said at the start, to conduct, to design and conduct a, a, a well, uh, no, to, to do a well designed and well conducted survey of any sort of decent size or scope, statistics, pretty advanced versions of statistics and research methods in their sort of ob objective, quantify, quantitative data collection version are involved. And um, even though surveys is something that most of the public, not only you, but most of the public will feel a certain familiarity with. In a certain sense that, well, yeah, you, know, you ask a few questions and you get answers and then you tally them somehow and that's what a survey means. To do them well, it actually requires quite a bit of a number of sophisticated uses of advanced research methodology and research design. So again, and here's a few related terms that you could find in a poll form of survey, if you want, questionnaire, instrument, assessment, scales, quantitative methods, statistics, all of these terms are part of the big sort of uh, family of methods that I would call, or that, that, I, that I'm using for short, the short survey methodology. Make sense? So why would we use surveys? So now that we know a little bit about what they are, why would, do, would we use surveys? Let me ask for a couple of uh, examples from you. What is a survey used for? What is a survey that you know that you've either taken or been related to, participated in, used for? Yes? Um, I just took it yesterday. It was from my statistics course. They were asking um, political views. Political views. Yeah. So what was the, the goal? That, that was the thing being measured, if you will, but what was it being done for? Not sure. Okay, not sure. That's, 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 uh, that's probably the most common answer to why, why a survey is being conducted. We don't necessarily know where it's being conducted when we take it. Yeah? I uh, took a uh, survey on campus about two months ago. This uh, person was basically trying to determine if um, you would buy a brand knowing that it was fake and how much you would, would be willing to spend knowing that it was fake in comparison oh. to actual a real product. Yeah, Market research is an area where a lot of survey uh, methods are used. So in that case, it was some kind of product, investigating product or consumer attitudes, consumer preferences. Any others? Yeah. To collect data, um, for example, who buys what brand um, and what age group they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many different types of market research. Any other non-market research? Yeah. I could, I could just think about trying to measure, measure disparities. Measure disparities of what kind? Um, you, know, you, could, you could do it from anything. So like, I know that a lot of us here are probably going to be researching something like disparities within the community college. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, like I heard someone say something about like access to mental health on campus between like white students and people of color. Yeah. Yeah, very good. That's another good example. And let me bring both of those examples and any others you're thinking of. I know that you're thinking of a few more. Um, together and thinking in some general sense of what we use surveys for, which is essentially to describe, that's a, an economical uh, uh, term that's used in, in the textbooks that I use, but by describing we typically know something more specific than that. And so it can be knowing, understanding, monitoring, keeping track of explaining an issue, a certain issue in a certain population, right? And so the issue of uh, consumer preferences or taste or distaste for, uh, what is it, pirate brands or original brands, that'll be one phenomenon that we would, uh, we might be able, maybe interested in exploring. Another one might be <coughs> 
student experiences in, in community college and, and disparities in their sort of experiences living there or disparities in their experience while they're there and moving to careers or further education, etc. You name it, there's a bazillion different phenomena, that social phenomena that we may want to understand, keep monitor, monitoring or get a, be a closer, better handle on that a survey will allow us to do because it allows us to investigate issues uh, typically in a larger scale. I know that you've already, well, I, I can't quite remember if you've already had your ethnography and qualitative methods talks before me or if that's coming later. Uh, we had our interviews. Uh, in talk, we'll have our observations next right, so, so more qualitative ethnographic research methods are great for going in great depth in smaller samples and smaller subsets of data. Surveys are used to investigate these kinds of social issues in populations, which means we're going to take more of a broad, large-scale overview of these phenomena, right? <clears throat> and so we want to understand and monitor them, explain relations between different parts of that phenomenon, right? So how does background relate to experiences in co to college experiences or community college experiences? How does perceptions of uh, the value of the market uh, of the brand uh, factor in or explain decisions to purchase, etc., etc. All of those are phenomena that we may be able or interested in explaining relationships among. Um, and some of these research terms will, will keep popping up throughout my talk. Some of them I'll explain in some brief detail. Some of them I'll just allude to because, again, some of these things require class in and of themselves, but surveys can be used in research designs that are, you've probably heard of, either experimental or correlational. It doesn't really matter what type of study or research design you're using. If it's an experiment where you're randomizing people to a treatment and a control, or if you're just doing a true original sense survey where you're getting an overview of, a, of a, the state of an issue in a population without uh, any kind of uh, experimental design, which is termed a correlational design, <coughs> doesn't matter what design you're using, you can still be using instruments or techniques that will fall under survey methods generally. And like I said before, any one of those will involve some form of statistical or in fact a variety of statistical techniques in order to design, to build samples, to design samples, and then to analyze the data that comes out. We're certainly not going to get into uh, statistical analysis today because that, that topic requires its own set of you know, folks uh, get PhDs only in some of those techniques and so we're certainly not going to try to that but be always aware that statistics are involved from the start throughout and towards the end uh, at every uh, little step in, in survey research uh, methods. So let's start with, uh, well, let's start getting into some of the more specifics of why we should care about survey methodology and what, what these kind of techniques and this mindset in fact uh, uh, those techniques you could subsume in terms of a mindset about what information we're collecting and how to interpret from surveys. So, actually, this slide was supposed to come before the other one, so the, the reverse. Let me just show you this one and I'll come to the other one. So this is just a list of, and I know you, you'll have the, the PowerPoint available at some point, and so if you're interested in, in looking at some surveys, some of the highest profile surveys out there, at least in the fields that I work in, Here's a few examples. Uh, the census, of course, is the biggest one if you want. That one, someone, someone would say it's not even a, a survey because it's not an overview, it's a census, but you know, the techniques are, are still the same. So I'm still thinking about the, the, the nitty gritty, so to speak, of, of, of survey methods and why we care about them. So if you read this, statement in a report from some uh, research study or in the press that would be something very come to find something like this in the press i'll give you just a few seconds to read it take it in and tell me what do you think about it what imagine that you just read this from a report imagine that you are interested in this topic what's your reaction what what do you think about when you read this? It's a low number. It's a low number. Low number. All right. 30% of parents were satisfied with the uh, school climate of their children's school. What, is, what do you mean by school climate? Good. That's what you mean? Same question? Okay. 
the phrasing of the statistics, especially at the beginning, is very important. Right? Nearly 80% rather than just 80%. Right? Like, and yeah, I'm done with that one. Just a um, we don't know how many of how many people they surveyed for it of the parents. We don't know what was the sample size? Yeah. yeah. We don't know where the survey was conducted. We don't know when the survey was conducted. Same. Conducted. Same. Yeah, we don't know the grade level. Grade level. We don't know what satisfied means. We don't know what satisfied means. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So you're pointing exactly all of the issues here, or nearly all of the issues. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of questions. There's another question there? No? It's a whole bunch of questions that if you read this in passing, you say, okay, so 80% of parents are satisfied with school claim. But if you really read it, if you really stop closing and say, okay, what does this mean? Then you start coming up with a lot of very specific but very important questions that if you notice, you would need to know the answer to all those questions that you ask. I would say all of them. You would really need to know the answer to all of those questions in order to really make sense of this little statement. Right? So let's talk about, little, we'll come back to this little uh, uh, statement uh, or, or this uh, issue uh, throughout. Let's talk about how it relates to different aspects of survey methodology. And so, survey methodology, and this is a, 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 one of many definitions you can find, it's not the definition, but it's a definition, it's a series of principles of design, collection, processing, and analysis for minimizing the cost and maximizing the quality of survey data. Another related but different definition says that it's the study of sources of error in surveys and how to make the numbers produced by surveys as accurate as possible. And I like those two definitions because one describes basically, you know, these are techniques to make surveys better, basically, to make the best surveys we can. And the second one focuses on the key ways in which we could go wrong in, this, uh, in designing, carrying out, interpreting surveys. And this, uh, this um, way of thinking about surveys of error is particularly useful to think because it, it, it brings us to the mindset of let's avoid the main types of errors that folks can uh, uh, sort of uh, be uh, fall for um, in designing surveys. So that's, that has a very sort of a, a useful um, pedagogical quality because it put, makes you alert about the things that can go wrong in designing and conducting a survey. So um, the four areas of key, key areas of survey research which are related to the four main types of errors that we can uh, incur in designing and so conducting surveys are listed here. Coverage, sampling, response, and measurement. Specification is at the middle, tie them all together. So don't worry too much about them. And so survey methodology, again, you can think of as a series of techniques that will allow us to understand and minimize each of these sources of error. Or at least assess their influence, the degree to which we should or should be worried about them and how we can sort of keep control and keep tabs about them so that we can get the best information out of our service. Right? So let's start with the first, coverage. So back to this statement. Remember when I said nearly, you came up with nearly all of the relevant questions that I, that I had thought of? This is one that you didn't ask, which is also just as well, right? What do we mean by parents? Which parents? Where? What kind? I could actually, I, I could have actually also highlighted here in red school. What school? What types of schools? Right, so coverage it's basically the idea that we need to be very clear about the population we're defining and how we're covering it. How the techniques we're using, the data uh, that we're trying to access, relates to the population that we're ideally trying to get at, right? And we're trying to understand, monitor now. So the target population is a total group of elements, is some technical lingo, I could have just used subjects, but since 
Sometimes the subject are people, elements works. So total group of elements, people, students, schools, companies, you can, you can, the, the unit can be, can be different. That we try, are trying to collect data and we're trying to make inferences about that we're trying to understand. And one of the very first things you start to realize when you study survey methodology is that this target population, it's something that needs to be, or it's by definition something that's finite, specific, and accessible to you. By definition, that's what it is. But you may or may not be very clear about what is your target population and how that finite, specific, and accessible population is defined for your case. So if we say, 80% of parents in, well, let me, let me define this, this, this second term and then I'll ask you to think a little bit about it. So that's the target population and the sampling frame or the sampling population, also known as sampling population, is the set of elements, again, people, students, institutions, whatever, that we're going to be able to select or to reach given the approach to data collection that we've selected. And so who are we going to be able to to actually be able to go and talk to. And the coverage error, here's where coverage comes. The coverage error is the difference between those two. Who are we going to try, who are we trying to make inferences about? What, what population are we trying to understand? And what population are we going to actually be able to reach? You can think about instances of under coverage where you're missing some elements from your target population in your frame population, or over coverage, which is not as common, but it's also a, 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 a problematic issue where you have more um, um, subjects in your sampling frame than cover the population. And so you have elements in it that do not belong in the population. So let's go back to that. So here's a, a, a or the visual of it. Let's go back to this statement and think about target populations and sampling frames here. Start specifying the questions that you were asking before, plus a couple that I just added in terms of these specific issues of methodology. So what would be your questions about coverage now with respect to this item? To the, or this statement. We don't know if it's an item or if it's a something else or a summary of items, but what are your questions about coverage related to this statement? Yes? What is the target demographic of sample? What is, the, what is the population? What is the intended population? Which which is another way of saying what's you know what, what do we mean by parents in schools, right? This is a question that I was asking before. What, when we say parents in schools, that has a way of you know, being self-explanatory, but nothing in survey research is self-explanatory. Everything has to be specified because it can matter a great deal if you mean, by parents, you mean, uh, I don't know, give me one example. What, do, what can we mean by parents? Uh, marrying divorced parents? Marrying divorced parents. If we got African-American parents looking about the children. Can you say that again? African American parents? Yeah, so we can be speaking about specific subgroups within the big term parents, right? We could be talking about, maybe this survey is about the experiences of single parents, right? And so that makes a very big difference if by parents we mean everyone who has a child, or if we mean specifically parents who are the sole providers of care for their children, right? certainly would make a great deal of difference in a lot of things. Probably everything that we can think about, and perceptions. What about schools? Yeah. Private schools versus public schools? Private and public? Home, middle school? Middle, elementary, high school? The geographic location of the school? Geographic location. Remember we said that the population needs to be finite? specific and accessible. So specific, specificity would say that we need to say where, in what region, is it in the state of California, is it in the county of LA, is it all of the school districts, is it, is it independent school districts, 
we need to really specify who the information is coming from so that it can be appropriately interpreted. So parents require some further specificity, schools require some further specificity. Good. Let's talk about sampling now. Going around that four cornerstones of survey research. Sampling. You've heard that term, I'm sure, before. Let me ask you to, those brave among you, to venture a, 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 a guess about what we mean by sampling now that you're thinking about in terms of survey research and sorts of error. Well, it's not possible to survey the entire population, so you have to find a sample group. Yes, that's essentially it. In very rare cases, it's very rare the case where you can actually say, okay, so we're going to survey single parents in, in public schools in the state of California, let's go talk to all of them and see what their perceptions about X, Y, and Z are. It's very rare when we're able to do that. We will typically we'll say, okay, we'll define this population. Now we're going to draw a sample from it to try to understand it, right? We're not going to talk to all of the hundreds of thousands of millions of elements of that population. We're going to try to take a sample. And the gap between that sample and the sampling population that it's tied to, it's the, or raises the possibility of some amount of sampling error. Right? We're not going to talk to all the million parents who belong to this group. We're going to talk to a sample of you know, 10,000. Actually, that sounds pretty large. I've, I've yet to conduct a study that I led myself, I participated in a few that included samples that big, but no study that I've ever conducted myself as a PI has had a sample of 10,000, know, so maybe 1,000. So how come we're able to make inferences about a, a million with a sample of 1,000? Seems like we're missing a great deal of information from that. That's under coverage? No, it's not coverage, right? Coverage, we've already, as, as we move forward, we're going to assume that we've taken care of the previous source of, of, of error. In this case, we're, we're satisfied that our sampling frame covers our target population in a way that we're happy with, right? So that's taken care of. Coverage is okay as far as we're concerned for the purposes of this particular example. So having taken care of that, now we move to, now we, the target, the, the sampling population is now our, sort of our ideal that we want to get to. We're going to draw a sample from it. The difference between that sample and that um, frame population is what we're worried about now. And this is what people uh, refer to or allude to when they use the term whether the sample is representative or not. Right? It's assuming that we already define a population that we're comfortable reaching out and that we want to understand. We're going to draw a sample of a much smaller size to understand that population. The first, second, and third questions in your mind should be, well, how close is that sample we drew to representing the population it's intended to sort of, uh, 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 replace or substitute for? And so when we talk about how, when we ask that question, what are we talking about? When we say, how close is this sample from representing the population? How representative is the sample? What do we mean? What is that issue of representativeness or sampling error? Let's come up with different issues or points with error again. Like accuracy? Accuracy, yes, that's a term related. How, how do you, say more, accuracy of what? Um, Of the sample as it relates to the population. Yeah, the yes. Population. Mm -hmm. Good. Could demographics be one as well? Say more? Like, you know, say you're, you're surveying single parents in one area and their experience is going to be very different than single parents in another area with less resources, perhaps. Yeah, and so if your population involves both areas and you only survey parents in one, then you have a problem, right? So there's two types of error that we can incur. So that's one type of error that I'm going to call sampling bias, right? So if you intended to know and to understand parents' uh, experiences, uh, single parents' experiences with school climate in two counties, and you survey parents, you sam sample parents to include in the survey from only one of those two counties, 
then that's a problem of bias, right? Systematically, the parents in one of those areas selected at random. In the remaining 999,000, were not selected at random. And so to have that established, that the, the process of missingness occurs at random, is very valuable for us statistically, because it allows us to make a lot of inferences and a lot of uh, jump a lot of steps in saying, okay, so these thousand uh, uh, subjects represent the, thou the million population, the population of one million, plus minus a certain error that's defined by the difference between those, those two numbers. Right? When you see polls, let's say this candidate has this uh, intention of vote, vote plus minus, or this group says that they prefer this issue uh, or are positive of this issue plus minus, we're always talking about that comes with a lot of statistical work that, that, that reflects the random error involved in taking the sample from the population. But the example you gave us is this second type of error, which is systematic. Right? Everyone in that region or in that county was not sampled. That's not by mistake. That's, that could not have happened by error if, you're, if we're drawing balls out of a gigantic hat. Right? It means that there was something systematic there that excluded members of a certain subgroup from the sample. And that would be an issue of bias. It's still error, but it's a systematic type of error, yes? call you and it'll be like, do you meet all these criteria? If you don't, then... Yeah. So now you, now you see where they're going, right? They're, they, they, they're trying to make sure that they're actually covering their... Uh, it's, it's both an issue of, uh, of coverage and an issue of sampling for them when they're asking you those questions. They want to really understand the respondents, the folks that they collect data from, and how they relate to the population and the target population. So. What about this then? Nearly 80% of parents were satisfied with school climate. And I actually didn't think of highlighting, I don't know, what was your name? Brian. Brian. Uh, Brian's point that the nearly there actually can signal something. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not content free, right? It's not neutral. It can, if, if we wanted to, to emphasize how low it is, we could have said only or less than 80%, right? Or only 80%. To say nearly 80% kind of signals that we're happy with that number and that it's, it's a positive result. Uh, and that's, that's a very, very short and important point. But let's set that aside for a second. Let's just focus on the 80%. Imagine that I didn't write nearly. What about the 80% now? Oh, I'm still not too good from here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 80% of what population? Yeah. The sample. 80% of the sample. Right? 80% of the sample. I was thinking um, more than half the population of the sample. More than half? Mm-hmm. Since it's 80%. Right, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a lot more than half. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the key point here, yes. Right. So the sample size, it's, it's, it's not negligible here. It's, it's important. But more than that, it's the 80% and to first realize that this is 80% of a certain sample and that to the extent that we say 80% of parents, we don't mean 80% of the million parents. We mean 80% of the sample that we collected. And so by focusing on this 80% and making the obvious immediate leap that everyone does of saying 80% of parents, not 80% of this sample of parents, we are basically assigning complete, clear, clean, unquestionable representativeness to the sample of the population, right? You're saying, well, this sample can fill in for the population and we're comfortable with that. Yes? Oh, I was just gonna uh, elaborate on that, that it could have been a sample size of like five people and maybe three people said uh, they were satisfied with it at 60%, but since they were one person off, you can kind of manipulate the data by saying they were 80%. Yes, yeah, so so that's how the, the sample size factors in. We are, again, we're assigning to the sample some properties that make it kind of 
substitute for the population, but there's different types of samples. There are samples of different sizes, there are samples that were created or constructed in a way that makes them closer or farther away from the population that have more or less error, that are more or less bias. And so we're, we're as the methodologies where our job is to make sure that it, inf it is in fact an appropriate step to take to sort of ignore the fact that this was a sample and assign that 80% to the population. It is our job to ensure that that link is there. And it is often not. Right? It is often not. In many samples, in many studies, in many data out there, there are certainly legitimate questions about how that sample was constructed and whether that 80% can actually fairly represent the population. So sampling error, sampling issues. Let's talk about response errors or response um, issues, issues with response or actually more appropriately non-response. So we're happy with our sampling frame, we're happy with our sample, and we, we design a sampling frame and a sampling uh, frame population that we're, we think is close to our target population. Our sample is pretty darn good and approaches the sampling, the, uh, the, the frame population in a way that we're satisfied with and we think we have a pretty good handle, good size, good match, etc., etc. How can we, how can we still go wrong? Let me go back to this item. How can we still go wrong with that 80%? Even if those three things are taken care of. Ah, yes, hold on to that one, because that, one, that one's coming. That's the fourth little box that we're going to spend a lot of time on. So hold on to that thought. We'll, we'll get to that. But before we get there, so 80% of the sample. What else could, what, are, what other layer of complication or layer of nuance do we have between that 80% and the target population. Yeah. If you think about it in terms of response, uh, there could have been a target about there, I mean a target group of hundred people and only seventy five responded. Exactly. That's the issue of response or rather non response. So we have a good target population or a good sampling frame that approaches our target population. We have a really good great sample that we designed and that really covers or that really that really represents that frame population well. We go out and collect data by whatever means. We'll talk a little bit about the means in a, in a, in a, in a little bit. Who answers the questions? Who participates in the survey? It's out of our control, right? You go and you'll say, you know, Mrs. Martinez, uh, we have these questions about this, uh, uh, your experience with your school, your child's school. And Ms. Martinez may not be available, may not wish to participate, may stop halfway through the survey. Number of different reasons, a number of different uh, uh, factors that influence who actually responds. And so response error, or non-response error rather, it's the gap that exists. You see how we keep adding gaps, right? Layers of gap or error between our intended population that we're trying to understand and the information we actually have. So now we have another layer that is the gap between the sample we reached for data collection and the subset of that that actually responded. And so going back to your 80%, we collected a sample of a thousand that was very good and that we were satisfied for the other two types of error. It matters or it should matter or it typically matters it should matter a great deal to you if this 80% it means we asked a thousand parents and 800 everyone responded and 800 of them said X that's different from we asked a thousand parents 300 responded and 80% of those 300 said X right why why is that what why are those two not the same I mean, Again, it seems self-explanatory, but it's actually not. Did you want to say? Yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to elaborate on that. So let's say if your sample's in fact a thousand, and the 300 respondents are all salaried workers who have the time to take a survey, and the other three or 500 are factory workers who have to be in by 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., exactly. they're excluded from being included. In exactly. Exactly. So that extra layer itself can have another, you know, itself can add another uh, layer of error that itself can be of two types, right? It can be just that, you know, 100 people were missing at random for whatever reason that we don't care. Well, that just means that our sample turned out to be 900 instead of 1,000. Right? Fine, we can deal with that. It's, it's just a random error, a little bit more random error thrown on top of, it, of what we had. But if something like this happens, where a certain subset, right? Once we went out, once we went out to collect data, it turns out that the way we did it was so that we didn't reach systematically. We weren't able to reach one subset of that group of that population, target population that we were really interested in understanding. That's not sampling error. That's not random error. That's bias. Right? It's error in the broader sense that we're going to be wrong in assuming that this 80% of parents includes that group because it doesn't or it doesn't to the extent it should, right? So, non-response, we need to be really mindful of, in addition to these issues of designing a, a, a sample that covers the frame population, that in fact, that, that, that represents the frame population, that in turn covers the target population, we need to be mindful of the ways in which our data collection techniques may interact with subjects or with context factors to make it so that some may have higher chances than others to respond, right? Chance, a chance or an inclination, right? Another scenario that I could that I could uh, present is so the the one you you described, it's entirely based on our failing to realize that this data technique, the data collection approach, would miss entirely a group that was not at home at that point, right? We're going home, and at that time that we decided to go this subgroup wasn't going to be home. Can someone think of another example of an issue of response or non-response that, that could play up in a very similar way, but that doesn't involve showing up and not being able to reach someone? Um, maybe the parents that were notified of it like in advance, or the parents that are involved in the school and uh, work in the school. Yes, so the notification, that's a, an even earlier way in which we could have excluded the, 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 the subset. The way in which the sample was notified was so that only a certain subset <laughs> learn about the, the survey. Just a second. If the survey was like door to door and the interviewer who went there who was like with a certain type of ethnicity or something and they didn't trust that person, yes. they might be kind of like a problem. Yes, exactly. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. Yeah, I was going to, it's kind of going off of her, like if they speak another language, language. or something, you're excluding a whole different group of people. Right? Yeah, exactly. So those types of issues that, inter uh, their interaction between the subject uh, background, subject characteristics, the, in the, 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 the people that want to survey, and something about the structure or the composition or the design or the characteristics of the survey, which includes in some instances, for example, when we have face-to-face -face or door-to-door, -door, the characteristics of the people that become the data collection mechanisms, interactions between those two areas, the survey and subject characteristics, could make it so that even though we actually show up at everyone's door and we reach them, they don't respond. Or they don't respond in the same numbers or with the same uh, sort of a, a, a mindset. Or they're not inclined to give information that is as forthcoming or as truthful or as you name it, right? So all of those issues can make it so that we're, you know, again, we're throwing layers of complexity, layers of error. 80% of parents can be slightly or somewhat more far farther from what we're imagining as 80% of the population, as 80% of the respondents to this sample that cover this population in this way. Right? And so, this issue specifically brings up the notion in several of your, of your comments, you notice that there were already, you were already hinting at a uh, question that had to do with how we we're collecting the data, the specific data collection techniques and how those may interact with uh, the subject characteristics to give us 
more or less confidence that we have um, avoided important issues of non-response. There's two primary methods of collection, the data collection in surveys. You can probably form those two families, methods that involve an interviewer, a person that goes and meets the interviewee and asks the questions in some way, and methods that do not involve a human collecting the data that are self-administered. And within those, we can think of um, methods that involve a human can be face-to-face, door-to-door, can be by phone. You've all probably had experience with a telephone survey. The face-to-face, door-to-door survey is getting less and less common these days for obvious reasons of cost and complexity. And the family that doesn't involve a family of, of techniques or methods that don't involve interviewer would itself be uh, now, in these days, it's, it's divided into many different subgroups. Mail is still present. It used to be the method that didn't involve interviewees. Eventually, telephone came, uh, I mean, uh, eventually, electronic platforms started to come up, and there were web surveys that people started to take. Lots of questions about whether administering the survey on the web or it, through internet, electronic media, covers or allows for respondents that we care about to respond, but this is, this is certainly a, one of the leading techniques these days. And it's not only web, now there's mobile, there's uh, all sorts of uh, electronic sort of hybrid approaches to collect data. And again, you can see how these uh, techniques interact with subject background and subject characteristics in ways that could be very much uh, consequential for non-response, right? What if we are, so one of the most prominent examples of this happening maybe 15 or so years ago when some of the political polls started to go considerably off or further off from, from their estimates. And they, were, they were getting it wrong by a lot more than they used to. Did anyone, does anyone, has anyone been, uh, well, you probably, <laughs> this started happening at a time when you probably weren't even born, but uh, this coincided with a very particular point in time when something that was true before stopped being true for a considerable segment of voters. What do you think that is? What happened 15, 20 years ago? 9-11. Uh, no, not that. So 9-11 was, was a particular sort of... NAFTA? No. Something about the respondents and how they would be able to, how we would be able to collect data with them. The internet. Before that. Think about phone surveys. Phone. Cell phones. Cell phones, right? How many of you have landlines? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's all of three, <laughs> right? So at some point, maybe 15 or so years ago, a considerable chunk of people, of voters, stopped having landlines, right? They just simply didn't have landlines anymore. It wasn't 90% of respondents as it seems to be now, but it was enough to throw the estimates off. You know? Eight, seven, eight, 20 percent, all those, those numbers are substantial enough that you could miss, your estimates could be off. And why do we worry about that? Is that error or is that bias? Think about it, is that, yes? So it is error in the colloquial sense of the term that I used, but if you dis the, the, the distinguish between random error and systematic error, Reach people by landlines, and that's biased. Yes. Everyone get that? No. no. So she said it was probably error at the beginning. You know, at, at first maybe you know you started missing a few people that turn out to not have landlines anymore. But as as more and more of that, uh, uh, as more and more subjects started to fall in that group, do you think that the 
you name it, 9% of respondents who have only cell phones and no landlines, is that a random sample of the population? Is that a random 9%? No, right? It's going to be a very specific type of 9%. A very specific 9%. Younger, probably with certain education characteristics, etc., etc. You're not missing, you're not just shortening your sample by 9%, you're systematically excluding a particular type of respondent. And that respondent is also very likely to hold certain views because of its composition. So that if your sample is excluding younger voters that don't have landlines anymore, only have cell phones, you're probably excluding some uh, substantial group from your estimates that would lean to vote in a certain way, right? So that's what uh, pollsters and, and, and folks who do service in a large scale study realizing again, 15 is the first instances or notices of this study to come up maybe 20 years ago, but you know, every year it got more and more clear that you couldn't continue to conduct landline surveys and expect the estimates to mean anything because of what we just saw right now, right? Three hands out of all of you. So that's not random error, that's systematic error, that's bias. But it's bias that came up not because how we identify the target population or coverage or sampling, it be, it, it's bias that emerged because of an interaction between the data collection method, landline telephone survey, and the population that we were covered, right? And so the next several, so there's a few hybrid uh, approaches to data collection that I, the survey collection that I'm listing there, you know, computer assisted. I, all of the face-to-face -face or telephone services that are computer assisted, there's, you know, there's like, you're gonna find someone with a pen and paper writing in a survey, they, they'll have a tablet and they'll be entering the data uh, in front, uh, it, whether it's telephone or face-to-face, -face, and there's a, a, a few others and multimodal surveys that, that employ more than one, right? So if, if, you, if you really care and you really want to describe your population, and your population includes both people who only use landlines and people who only use cell phones, well, so if you really care to represent the population as a well, whole, you're going to have to use both, right? And so you have multimodal uh, approaches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which mode, this is called modes of data collection, face-to-face, -face, telephone, internet, and which you should use, certainly uh, it's one of the uh, key areas of service search engines. That's what we spend all of our time when, we, when we're thinking about that little third box there with, uh, with response error, because it really can influence what groups will end up having data from. And the choice of mode, has to do mostly with match to the population that we're trying to get at. You know, literacy, age, culture, interview effects, sorts of things. Sensitivity, privacy. So another classical type of example in this area from psychology research, for surveys that involve sensitive topics, the mode of administration matters a lot. And so if, if you're going to do a survey of criminal behavior, it matters whether you're doing it anonymously over the mail or over the internet, or if someone's asking you face to face. Right? There's there's going to be inter strong interview effects. Same for you know, sexual behavior, so sur uh, service of sexual behavior, of which there are many, and the results tend to be taken as accurate, despite what you may think. You may read some of those surveys and think, hey, who really reports these things? Uh, no one's going to sit with uh, an interviewer and say, yes, I do these things and these things and prefer those things, because it's kind of not something you want to share with a, with, a, you know, with a stranger that just asks you to participate in a survey. And you're right, typically it doesn't happen that way, because for those types of surveys, those types of topics, that mode of administration of data collection wouldn't really work, wouldn't give us good, accurate data. We would have either a lot of non-response of, of specific types of subjects, or we would have responses that are inaccurate and people who aren't reporting accurately, right? So, anyways, you can decide to do internet instead of that, or you can decide to do, say, for example, face-to-face, -face, and I don't know if you've taken surveys like that where the interviewer has a tablet, and if there's a portion of the survey that it's sensitive, where the subject may not want to share the information directly with the interviewer, then the subject, the interviewer turns the tablet to the interviewer and says, here's a we're going to, to, to ask you now, but uh, the survey asks about a series of questions that you may, you know, that are sensitive and private, and so if you, if you want to just answer them, and then hit send, I will never see it, I can go back to them, and so it's just stored. That's a technique you can use, and a number of others in combination, right? But the point is, you need to make sure that the way you're going to collect the data is something that doesn't 
exacerbate uh, or, or cause some subjects to not want to participate or to not want to respond truthfully. In the next few slides, I'm just going to go very quickly over them because I have 15 minutes remaining and I want to get to measurement. There's four slides about the four main kinds of data collection that I've listed here with plus pros, pros and cons in each in each uh, column, and you can see that you know cost is a uh, you know, face to face has a lot of uh, pluses in terms of data accuracy, but it has a lot of minuses in cost and data intensity, etc. You can you can see how those you know, there's a balance. What's better tends to cost more. What's uh, cheaper tends to not be as accurate, etc., etc. And so you can play with those, and that's that's a whole area of research um, um, in sort of methodology that um, a lot of uh, folks work in and make pretty good money at that, actually. Um, modes of collections, telephone, mail, internet, etc. Good. All right, so let's spend a little time at least with the, on the last box here. And so this you did raise when I first asked you to think about this statement. Several of you did raise this question. What do we mean by satisfied with the school climate? Right? And you could even further break down into what do we mean by satisfied and what do we mean by school climate or the other way around. What's school climate and what do we mean by satisfied? Right? One thing that learning a lot and knowing a lot about survey methods makes you, it's very annoying uh, to interviewees and to general people because you can stop asking those questions and you know, it doesn't make sometimes a very fluid conversation, social conversation when someone says, I, I read that 80% of parents were satisfied with school climate and you start asking all these questions. It can be annoying so you can, should use it with moderation and in the right context otherwise Folks are not going to have, not gonna have a, a lot of uh, inclination to have a drink with you, but it's important, <laughs> right? And 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 when when people ask you questions over the phone, you know, um, we're, we're um, asking you to participate in this survey about blah blah blah, and they start asking you questions, and you start going back, and no, that's not a good item, that's not a good question. The response options are off, but you know, we need a lot more of us who are annoying survey uh, subjects, so that the survey starts to being a lot more accurate, a lot better. So let's talk about what. What's, what were the questions about satisfied in school climate? Why, why were you concerned and why did you ask questions about what we meant by that? Because we don't really know what climate means, maybe just like with how the school looks or like how clean it is, but we don't know what, it, what they're referring to, like is it the teachers or, or something like that. Absolutely, yeah. Climate, it's a big it's a, it's a small word that actually captures a lot of very big phenomena, and, 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 and we would like to know exactly how those phenomena were conceived in that study so that we can understand what they mean by climate, right? Um, satisfied would have to be defined because satisfaction can be subjective. Mm -hmm. Satisfaction is subjective, and so what, is, what exactly did, did, did the respond, what exactly were the respondents asked? And how did they respond? That leads us to summarize that as they were, they were satisfied. Any other questions? Any other nits you want to pick on this? I'm sure there are more. So another cornerstone, another box in that, that diagram, another layer of error. Right? Remember I told you that all, all these areas of survey methodology <coughs> were basically trying to help us prevent or at least closely understand one type of error we could be making in interpreting this, this finding of the 80% of parents. So this is the last one of the four and one that is just as important, although different, from the other three. If you notice, the other three had to do with who, what was being alluded to or captured who was included in the sample, who was the population, how do we cover them. It had to do with the 80% of parents, if you want. This has to do with the thing being reported. This has to do with the satisfaction in the school climate. So this is the gap between the subject responses in the survey, what they actually responded, either, I could do going like this, but they, that's, a, that's, a, that's an affectation from, all, from many years ago, but they probably just punched it in or responded in to an interviewer. 
to an interviewer, the gap between their actual responses in survey and the broader concepts that these responses are representing in our work, right? So this brings up the whole field of measurement in the social sciences. And so how do we measure, how do we assign values or quantities to properties and attributes of objects when these objects are not actual objects, that we have an object, a physical object, that I can be weighted and there's an objective way of determining that, but there's no objective way of determining satisfaction with school clan, right? Those are constructs, those are things that we construct, that we build from responses, from evidence, that are useful, that can be useful to understand, but that we need to really closely understand to make sure that they can actually be understood, understood in those quantitative sense. So the whole fields of psychometrics or so, and sociometrics, which are sub-branches, if you will, of statistics, um, but, but have their own life in their own programs and their own departments and their own uh, journals and areas of research um, are concerned with how do we best assign numbers and quantities to psychological and social uh, attributes of objects, people, institutions, organizations, states, societies, etc. So, What if, what if I told you that that statement that we've been working with came from that item in the survey? It's a very vague question. Vague question? Yeah. How so? Well, it's just the same way how, like, when we were asking each other, like, what is what does satisfied mean? What does school time result of this mean? Every respondent's going to have a, a different kind of opinion of what this means. And so I think this, this, this would have been a more appropriate thing where it, it should have been, uh, I forgot what it is, but it's more like more like interview based where people can get some ideas on it before you can create a more specific question. Yeah. Oh, um, that, yeah. So instead of asking, are you satisfied, can like rank from one to five for the person to choose, like how much? Um, for the school climate, we can like, divide it into like sub question, like, are you satisfied with your peers' um, environment, or are you satisfied with your um, faculty interactions? Yeah. Yeah, so that points exactly to the two, you, both, both comments point exactly to the two main issues with this item. So, this item didn't really help us much. Didn't add any doesn't add any further clarity to understand this statement, right? Yeah, well, 80% of parents in this survey, in this uh, sample, reported they were satisfied. Yeah, you were, were pretty accurately reporting this, right? So in, in some way, it doesn't really involve another layer of error. There's no layer of error. This is what we found. And assuming that all the sampling part related to the 80% we're happy with, then that's it. No measurement translation, no measurement error, right? 80%, so that satisfied, yes, boom. And again, the problem here is that we're not interested in people's responses to that item. We're interested in people's perceptions about the construct that this item is supposed to represent. And so well, an item like this, you would very rarely find something like this because the things being asked are so broad that you really would be finding a, 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 an incredible variety of answers checked into yes, and an incredible, an incredible variety of answers checked as no's. And you would really not know what is it that anyone meant by being or not being satisfied with school time at other school, right? So number one, yes. Uh, this yes or no uh, option seems too constraining. It seems like you can certainly have a, a, a gradation or different levels of satisfaction and it seems a bit draconian to just say yes or no, are you satisfied or not? So one thing would be we would likely for this type of thing we want to have some kind of range of satisfaction from very satisfied to very unsatisfied with some intermediate points. But even more important, we really want to spell out what do we mean by satisfaction in school climate? Right? And spelling out means, oops, 
operationalizing the concept. What we're interested in understanding is school climate. And school climate is not something that's self-explanatory. School climate is something that we need to define. What do we mean by school climate? Physical, physical uh, uh, facilities, teacher uh, relationships, teacher relationships with, with kids, with the parents, uh, you know, facilities people, uh, community engagement, parent relations among themselves, you name it. It's a construct that you, if I don't actually know much about school climate, even though I've used this, this example uh, a couple of times of late, a, a friend of mine uh, gave me this example, but school climate is something that if we spend five minutes, that we're not going to because I only have five minutes left, uh, right now, we would very quickly um, develop into this very complex construct, which it is, and if we really want to understand uh, 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 school climate, then we would do that. Build it, when I said build it, I should have said operationalize it. Specifically said, by school climate we mean list the 10 things that we mean. And it shouldn't be, I mean, because I just thought of it, this is where your expertise, your substantive expertise comes in. And if you become a survey methodologist, you will partner up with folks who know a lot about school climate, who will tell you what school climate is, because you're not supposed to know that, right? You know a lot about statistics and sampling and measurement. You may or may not know much about s s uh, school climate. You'll partner up with researchers who know a lot about that and who will tell you what is it that school climate is, so that you can then include a bunch of items, a bunch of questions, that would then allow you to measure it, to cover it, to say, OK, so folks, uh, people said that they were more satisfied with uh, in these types of schools, parents were less satisfied with the facilities, the physical plan, but they were actually not dissatisfied with the teacher relationships or something. To really understand the phenomenon, supposed to report some meaningless blob of pseudo-information that anyone can interpret in any way they want. Right? So there's a bunch of alternatives. In, uh, in a couple slides, I'll give you a couple guidelines for uh, writing good questions, which should prevent you from ever asking a question like this in a survey, or a question like this, which I just love and like, like, like to, to include in intro talks about sort of methods. I just, I just love this item. Don't you love it? It's amazing. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so this is not a good item <laughs> for some of the same reasons. It's actually not that much worse than this one, though. Yeah, and I don't mean that uh, uh, flippantly. It's, it's, it's not that much worse. This one is not that much worse than this one. Both are kind of meaningless. They're going to kind of yield meaningless information that we won't really be learning much from. So asking good questions, characteristics of high qual uh, quality questions. These are questions that match the construct of interest. That I, would, I should have added there that cover the construct of interest appropriately that are consistently understood, that when respondents, your respondents, the particular respondents you're going to be working with, so that matters, it's interaction with the uh, respondent characteristic. When they read it, they will know what you mean, and they will give you the information you're asking. Right? Leave no room for interpretation. That ask for information that the respondents can actually give you, right? that they can retrieve. You ask someone, uh, you know, what was uh, your... Uh, I don't know, what's, uh, how many hours, how many minutes, uh, I, I do a lot of uh, research with uh, teachers' instructional practices, and so if we ask parents about how much emphasis, how much emphasis their, chill, their child teacher puts into a certain type of problem in the class, that's not something the parent can actually tell us because they're not there. They may be given some information by the teacher, but they, don't, they cannot actually retrieve that information, they don't know it, right? And so that's something that we should, of course, be mindful of, that the subjects can give us information we want. That offer appropriate ways to respond, both options and mechanisms, right? So if it's something sensitive, give an appropriate way that uh, protects the subject confidentiality and privacy. If it's something that is best graded, uh, rated in some gradation, don't ask it as a yes or no, etc. so appropriate options. It yeah, maximizes the, uh, the chance that responses will be willing to provide a correct answer. So that's the, that's the uh, other point about uh, confidentiality. So, twice. 
So I'm going to skip over a bunch of uh, uh, slides now that uh, have some examples of um, sc scoring or scaling approaches, so dichotomous, like we said. Is that yes or no answers are actually not forbidden. You can use them as long as you have many items, many, many items to then aggregate over. You can do that. That makes it easier to respond. The questions need to be so that they actually allow for a yes or an easy yes or no answer. But if, you, if they can, if you can formulate it that way, you can use, you know, 20 yes or no items will, will add up to a, to a nice uh, uh, continuous scale. That's another one that I like, but I'll skip over it. Okay. So oftentimes you won't be satisfied with yes or no answer, and so that will make you want to do something like more of a graduation, what's known as a Likert or Likert type items that have you know your typical strongly agree to strongly disagree. There's questions about how many points in the scale it should be, three, five, seven, eleven. Uh, you know, if you take my class, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, um, should there be a middle point, a neutral point uh, or not? We'll spend some time thinking about that. All those are very specific sort of technical characteristics of the items and there's there's Discussion and debate around all those, it all, it all matters for the quality of the information we collect and the grasp that we'll have at the end on what we actually meant by both school climate and satisfaction, right? Which was the last, was the last um, cornerstone or that box in that cornerstone diagram. So just to wrap up, do you really need to worry about, uh, about all this? Like I said, um, this turns into a pretty annoying subject for in some conversations, an uh, annoying part in some conversations, and it, it starts to feel like you're being too neat picky. Uh, you just can't let go of those little things, but they're not superfluous sort of uh, purist takes on things. You're not being uh, an unreasonable uh, sort of uh, uh, fanatic when you think about these things. It is. The whole edifice of quantitative social science rests on you being satisfied that these four main types of issues have been kept under appropriate control. So that you can make sense and really do something about the fact that either only 80% or nearly 80% or however we think about that 80% that we can be confident that it is 80% and that it reflects our thoughts about what satisfaction and um, uh, uh, school climate means so that some you know congressman can introduce a, a, a legislation that does something about it if, it if we think that it's too low or that you know or that focuses on something else if we think it's high and we're fine right a lot of po not, not just social science policy mean very meaningful important impactful policy rests on things like this which can or may or may not have all of the support and may or may not mean exactly the kinds of things that we assign them to, depending on how the study was conducted, how the data was collected, and what the various aspects of survey methodology, how they were kept under control. Uh, just to finish up with something I said at the start, uh, we just glanced over a, a vast a, a area, a vast landscape of methodology, and a lot of the things that I said, entire uh, slides, or sometimes just specific words within a slide, include or take entire classes that people take in programs, sometimes entire programs. Um, um, but hopefully this gives you an overview of, of why this is important and, and the, the main aspects of, 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 sort of highly uh, complex technical work that is involved, and just to close, because I know that you are you are at the point where you're thinking about careers, majors, and options for the future. That <coughs> this is one of the areas where there's uh, most interest and need for highly skilled talent in the social sciences. But by that, I mean something that's very, very wide, right? I don't mean that you're going to be a sociologists doing a particular type of survey work. No, psychology, sociology, market research, business, economics, uh, uh, demography, political science, all of the basically non-pure mathematical or biological sciences, in fact some of the biological sciences too, involve some version of these types of, of, of techniques. And so um, 
you will find a lot of graduate programs uh, that offer training in these, and once you're done with those, a lot of uh, 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 opportunities and avenues for research because it is a highly transferable skill. It's a very high level skill that few people have and that works in so many different areas. So there's, that's, a, that's a very appealing thing, I think. It should be a very appealing thing about, a, 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 about an area of work when someone's considering it, when there's a lot of need for it, and you can transfer a lot of different skills, right? <coughs> so with that, I'll let you um, ask any and you know, all questions you have. I, I am I'm very uh, uh, thankful that you guys invited me, and uh, thank you. I'll see you in grad school. Do we have David? Ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes. Yes. Ten minutes. <coughs> or any questions? Yes. Uh, what is the most common error that you notice novices have in designing their survey, their surveys? Uh, well, depends how novice, but I think the most common error, if if, if by novice you, th you you mean someone who's really unfamiliar with this, who's close to like a just a uh, a plain clothes citizen of the street, I think the main, the, the, the key mistake is that they don't realize that these errors exist, right? So awareness of the error, or lack of awareness about all these types of ways in which these numbers can be misleading, is the first error, or the first sort of key, key barrier to appropriately understanding this data. Now, when, when you're talking about people who are starting to get into, into, um, uh, certain methodologies. So some, they're, they're aware. Imagine that you've taken an intro course and you're, you're already aware of all these four types of error, corners, sounds, and methodology. I think the most, I don't know if it's the most common, there's plenty, plenty of issues around the measurement uh, and around how do you capture complex constructs. But I think as important, if not more, even for areas where you may be measuring things that are more immediate and less complex, is thinking about the representatives of the sample. And in the social sciences specifically, very few of us can ever conduct large survey studies that have all of the statistical um, infrastructure necessary for doing statistical representativeness to a population, right? So I said, like I said, the largest survey I've ever conducted, I think, was a couple thousand students in a couple dozen schools. So it was not a sample that was statistically related to a population. I didn't have a list of the students. I didn't do all the statistical steps that are taken in order to ensure statistical representativeness, because I couldn't. I didn't have the budget. I didn't have the access to the students. It was just not something that was feasible. But I think the mistake, one of the mistakes that I tried to, to, to discuss with my students and, 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 and be very clear that not being able to do a proper statistical framing for a sample, it's something that all of us have to face in most of our work, but that, that doesn't mean that you can just do anything for a sample and that this convenience, this notion of a convenience sample, which is I'll just sample whatever 12 schools I'm able to get, okay, because you weren't able to conduct a proper statistical sample. So, um, I think I would say one of the key mistakes, one of the very important mistake in the social sciences, in the areas that I work in, I'm specifically in the School of Education, is to not realize that between a proper statistical sampling approach and a, I would say, very improper, weak, convenient sampling approach, there's a vast middle that, uh, of, of building purposive samples that could at least ensure some measure of qualitative representativeness. So you can say, okay, so I only had 20 schools, not statistically representative, but the way I created the schools, uh, the way I created the sample is such that these schools are diverse in these ways and represent the district in these other ways, capture, you know, I didn't just sample uh, 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 some of the uh, blue ribbon schools that are scattered around the, the, the city because that's, those are the ones that, that wanted to work with me, but I made some direct effort to make sure that my sample is diverse and qualitatively representative of some population. So that, that at least means something that can generate in useful hypotheses as opposed to not meaning much. <coughs> so that's a very long answer, but I think that's, that's, a, that's a problem that I find a lot and that I try to, to work with uh, students to avoid. Yes? So 
From what I'm hearing, it's not possible to be 100% representative with your target population. So, would it be, and I know there'll be a little bit of bias and systematic sampling, but to pick your target population based on what your sample is going to be kind of, like to go in hand in hand, like to say, because you can't say your target population is single parents and then you're only going to sample uh, randomly like single parents in a certain area, that's still not going to be as, I understand that 100 percent representative. So instead maybe to say your target population is single parents in this area and therefore I'm going to sample from that. Is that still yeah, so, bias? Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly true. So what happens when you want to uh, survey uh, you want to, to understand single parents' experiences with school climate in schools in California, but you are only able to work with public schools. Well, you are you can either belabor very hard and try again and spend a lot of other time trying to broaden your sample so that it includes private schools, in which case you could report data that reflect the experiences of single parents in schools in California, or you can just narrow your population right, and say, well, these are the experiences of single parents in public schools in California. And fine. I mean, th there's nothing wrong with that. You, okay, so you didn't cover private schools, but you're not implying that you did. And understanding the experiences of, of parents in public schools was still very much a worthy goal that uh, you know that you may want to pursue, unless the original goal was to specifically compare public versus private schools. You may be satisfied with that compromise, right? But if what you wanted to do is to is to compare experiences, oh, sorry, <laughs> com com compare the experiences of parents in uh, single parents in public versus private schools, and you're missing most of the parents in private schools, then you have a problem. Just, was, uh, I just I was just making a clarification, but like, so if you're, but what if your goal is if you really do want to understand? single parents in public schools in California, but yeah. you're only able to get like a very small sample, and so you can't talk about the 100% representational, can you still, like kind of like correlation versus causation, can you still allude that it is a representation potential? Okay, so there's two, pro two problems there that need to be disentangled. Correlation versus causation doesn't have anything to do with the sample, right? right? Correlation versus causation, that has to do with the design. I, I, I said first, experimental or non-experimental, correlational, and so, if your design is correlation, I'm meaning you're going to survey parents in all these um, schools in California, and that's it that you're going to do a one-off sample of perceptions, there is no way you're going to be able to infer causation. You're only going to remain in correlations. Even if, you're in, if you were surveying the whole population, right? Imagine that you're able to get to the million groups and everyone responds and you have perfectly covered all the population, there's no issues. You're still not going to get causation. That's a matter. That's an issue for the design. Now, the other separate issue is what is the distance between the sample and the population, and that very much rests on both random error about the sample size, how large is the sample, and certainly a sample of 10,000 is going to give you much a much more accurate feel for the population than a sample of 100. But as long as you can assume that it is random. Then you you just you you're giving an estimate and saying it's plus minus this much, right? And that's how some of the political polls are able to say with I don't know if it's surprising to you and they're getting less and less precise every year, but it's still kind of surprising that they would get it with a sample of a couple hundred or a few hundred. They would get these numbers plus minus a number that it's still small, even if it's you know plus minus four points. Stop thinking about it. It's kind of impressive. It's impressive that with a sample of a thousand, they might be able to say something about millions, right? That's because they are able to create this the, the sample in a way that ensures that there's not a lot of bias. There's only error, and if it's error, you can just take care of it statistically. If it's bias, then you're back in the in the first part of the answer, right? You either do it and cover that group that you want to cover, or you say, well, this survey represents the views of a population that does not include that group. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, okay, ask David. Um, yeah. So I noticed in your previous slide you mentioned that SR, uh, the social research methodology PhD is like a, it's a pretty um, in demand. Um, and a lot of our scholars, they're kind of thinking about, okay, what major should I go into? What PhD program should I mm -hmm. apply for? How would you say the, um, 
like the job market outcomes for social research methodology PhDs compared to more traditional social science disciplines like sociology or political science or psychology? Um, so, you know, you can, you can get, you can go into a sociology department and get a lot of the training in this type of technique that we offer in education. And in fact, some of our students take courses in sociology and psychology that may not be offered in our department or may not be offered at here. And so you can be in this general social sciences area in a MA or PhD program, MS or a PhD program of your interest. And if you're interested in methodology, you can take those courses, right? So you, if, if your interest is not exactly in education, you're more into sociology type issues, you can go into a sociology program and take a lot of these courses and some of them you probably will end up taking with us in education because that may be that year we may be the only ones teaching that particular course. So more than the specific program, or what's, what's special about our program is that our program is specifically in methodology. So if you're coming to the program in education, in methodology in the School of Education, you ostensibly have some interest, elaborate, uh, specific interest in education issues and in methodology because coming into your program means that you don't have an option about taking those methodological courses as a sociology PhD, which everyone does, but you are coming to take those methodology courses. So either through, and so that's, that's, what, that's what I would say that any graduate of ours, masters or certainly PhD, um, has, there's no one who I can think of from the past 15 years that did not have multiple options and had to think carefully about what path they needed to, they wanted to follow after grad school, because there are so many areas where they can go to work, right? Now, and so what I would say is, that's true, but that it, it would also be true of a sociology PhD or a sociology, quantitative sociology master that went into that program and made it a point to get training all of these techniques, which they can. And so someone who goes in sociology or marketing or psychology program and still takes this type of coursework will still be in that, will also be in that position of having a very wide variety of options to go to work because again, the techniques are widely applicable in many areas of social science and economics. And that. Can I ask you one final question? Um, are scholars thinking about what courses they should be taking now as community college students? And and in the future as uh, transfer students at a four-year university. So Statistics. What, yeah, so what Statistics. courses do you recommend like, that they take to be competitive for PhD programs in social science? Statistics. Statistics. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no question. Uh, and, and that's, that's, you know, if, even if you're not, if you're clear that you don't want to pursue a path in your research or, 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 or in your work professionally that would be based on you being an expert in these kinds of quantitative techniques, where you would, wouldn't be the methodological expert. Um, to go into those programs, a lot more and more of them require that type of familiarity with these types of techniques for your own research and for your own work, right? And so even if you don't uh, expect to be a uh, quantitative methodologist by training, you will be very well served by having a healthy background in quantitative methodology and statistics um, for applying to a lot of uh, graduate programs in, in the social sciences because a lot more and more of us are emphasizing those, those techniques and are, again, transferable techniques. If you learn statistics in education, there's a very small transfer cost to sociology or to anything else. Now. Uh, Terry McCarthy will come in a week or two and will tell you about the beautiful work she does in qualitative uh, methodology and I could not agree and emphasize more how important that work is. It's just fantastic the work that they do and I, I'm very lucky to be in a department in a, in a division that has both statisticians and ethnographers and we haven't, we're in the same meetings and we highly respect and, and value each other's work. But I don't think that she would disagree with the idea that the market it's pro probably quite a bit wider for folks who have some of the quantitative techniques uh, um, uh, than for uh, in-depth, uh, uh, rigorous, beautiful ethnographic uh, work, right? And so if your heart is in ethnography and quantitative methods, by any means do it because we need more of that 
uh, 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 work, and it's and it's also it needs to be very rigorous. And people, people don't realize that, that it's not about writing novels; it's about being very rigorous in research. Uh, but I think it's true that there's a lot more, in terms of a marketplace and a labor economy, there's a lot more room for transfer of quantitative skills. And that's what I do, and that's what I promote, and so that's my bias. That's a question over there. Pursuing this out of here, how tech savvy do you actually have to be, and how good at math do you actually have to be? Uh, you know, tech savvy, I would say, it's probably not a, an issue. Um, I'm kind of seeing that everyone who comes in, it's reasonably fluent with standard sort of uh, software and computer technology, and, and so. You're all a lot tech savvier than I am. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's not going to be, that's not going to be a, 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 an issue, I don't think. Um, but the second was um, good at math. So um, yeah, so that that one has uh, um, it relates to the previous question about uh, coursework. So um, in my program, uh, and I think this is going to be fairly applicable to the programs. You can apply, so my program is social research methods, right? But with, you can apply to social research methods. It's the same program, same PhD. But your advisor could be myself. Or your advisor could be Terry McCarthy, who we'll, we'll, you'll talk to, is it next week or in a couple of weeks? Next, next, next month. Um, and so in the same graduate program, you would be following a completely uh, or, or mainly qualitative uh, training uh, path or a quantitative training path. And depending on what you are applying to do in the program, even if it's the same program, you're saying, I'm applying because I want to do this type of work with this, with this faculty. If you're applying to the quantitative track, we would certainly look, for example, of the quantitative GRE scores. And those are very imperfect and coarse indicators of, of, of sort of ability, certainly. And there's no cutoff and there's no really hard and fast rule, but if you're applying to do advanced quantitative work and your GRE quantitative score is very low, right, in the 20s, 30s percentile, we would have concerns, right? If, if you know, we've had it in the past where someone said, you know, I, I have this great test taking anxiety and it's documented and I've had it and I have all this. And so look at all my coursework and my letters that say that I'm actually pretty good at math. I just, you know, that score, that means that that score doesn't mean anything. And so in that case, we can discard it. But say for a rare instance or something like that, yeah, to apply to an advanced statistics, to a program that involves advanced statistics, you better be reasonably good at math. We're not talking about 99th percentile and you know math genius that can multiply backwards seven digit numbers. It's not yeah. that, but to have certain familiarity and, 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 and comfort with you know correlations, regressions, some some some. Uh, to not be afraid of math for sure, <laughs> right? And so again, uh, in our program, we're talking about probably many more and focus on the rest, right? We're basically looking at, the, at those numbers for just for flags that we may be we may be um, uh, interested in looking at. But I would I can perfectly tell you that it's something that takes the least weight and that we look more at the statement that really explains. And, and, and the statement tends to give us a much better sense of what kind of comfort and familiarity the candidate has.